Aloha and welcome to Think Tech, raising public awareness about technology, energy, globalism, and diversification. As part of the Think Tech series, today's show is Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez. Joining me today is Ed Klein. Ed Klein is a professor of applied linguistics at Hawaii Pacific University in Honolulu. Today we're going to talk about his lifelong experience of many years working in Korea where he began as a Peace Corps volunteer and would return in different capacities. Uh, he still stays connected now helping train a lot of Korean teachers here in Hawaii. Uh, I want to remind you that we broadcast live on the internet at 2 and at 4 every weekday and all of our shows are streamed on Ustream or on Spreaker.com. If you want to want the links to our live streams and our previous broadcasts, just go to thinktechhawaii.com. If you'd like to join us here in our downtown studio gallery for any of the shows, just write to j at thinktechhawaii.com. So we're joined today by Ed Klein, and Ed, welcome. I'm glad to have this opportunity and look forward to this conversation, a retrospective, some reflections on the many years you've had in Korea, a country that has been, of course, under a lot of transition and change the last, well, 40, 50 years. Uh, you're a professor at HP. I wanted to maybe ask if you could start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and both what you know brought you to Hawaii some years ago, and then we'll look at you know how you got connected to Korea so tell us briefly. okay thank you Carlos and thank you for inviting me uh, to the show I um, am a Midwesterner mm. I grew up in the suburbs of Kansas City and uh, went off to Milwaukee to be uh, educated at Marquette University mm -hmm. it was at that time uh, it was in the 60s and Kennedy was assassinated during the time I was a, a student an undergraduate student, and the Peace Corps had just started two mm -hmm. years before he was assassinated, and so Peace Corps uh, was in my mind mm -hmm. all those, uh, maybe my junior, senior year. In my senior year, I applied. Uh, they ask you where you would like to go in <laughs> Peace Corps, and I wrote down my first choice was uh, the Philippines but I didn't really know much about the Philippines, <laughs> and uh, I also included other countries, uh, Thailand perhaps. The letter came back actually offering me uh, a chance to start training, but the country was Korea. Would I like to go to Korea? Mm. Uh, I went to the library and made sure I knew where Korea <laughs> was. That's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. No Google back then. You couldn't <laughs> quit, you couldn't on your iPhone. So you had to, had to go to the library. Up. Yes. Uh, called up my mom and told her what I had received. She was very upset because she says there's a war there. Uh -huh. This was 1965. Yeah. Yeah. There was no war there, yeah. but she remembered the war very well. Uh, but to make a uh, long story short, I, I did accept the mm -hmm. uh, possibility, and especially when I found out from as somebody that I knew there at Marquette that the training was probably be going to be in Korea, in, um, in uh, Hilo, Hawaii. Oh, okay. Hilo, Hawaii. Well, I didn't know where that was either, <laughs> but I found out. And uh, lo and behold, in June of 66, uh, I got on a plane and went to Hilo, Hawaii from mm -hmm. Kansas City. Amazing. And um, there in Hilo, we trained for uh, three months. Mm -hmm. And it was a cohort, so the group that was all going together? Yes, it was a rather large cohort. It was 120 people who, mm -hmm. who came to the training center at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, three months later, we were down to 100 people. Mm -hmm. 20 people had either uh, self-selected out or had been deselected. That was mm -hmm. a nice word. Huh? Cool. Deselected yeah, yeah. out of the uh, Peace Corps. Disappeared, sort of, in one night. <laughs> Put on a plane and back home or something. not there anymore. Ooh. Uh, but we, you know, we studied Korean language, we studied Korean culture, uh, we did, uh, in those days they had us doing certain uh, athletic things because we were supposed to be of a certain stamina mm. to, to go overseas. And uh, uh, we learned, you know, the backgrounds of Korea such as, it, uh, of a Peace Corps such as it was at that point. Um, 
three three months of it. Yeah. And at this point, Peace Corps was relatively new, as you said. It probably started in '61, I recall. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yes, and uh, and so they were obviously training, and, and it was sort of you know learning as they're going. They had experience in other countries, but this was the first group to Korea. So you were part of the so-called K1. Is that the name given? That's right. We were called K1. Mm -hmm. We were uh, supposed to teach English. Uh, the majority of us were in an English program. Mm -hmm. uh, some were supposed to teach physical education, and a few were supposed to teach science. Mm -hmm. and, but the majority of us were in uh, preparation to teach English. Mm -hmm. And um, that uh, was um, somewhat difficult in those days because the people that they had hired to teach us the teaching methods mm -hmm. were in a, a cycle of thinking that the best way to teach was to have the students prepare themselves what they wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. And so here are, you know, I think English teachers made up probably about 80 or 85 of the f ones that finally went. And we were being asked, what would you like to learn? <laughs> what, what should we teach you? And wow. it happened to be that a few of us had been in teacher training programs as undergraduates. Mm -hmm. I was one of them. I, but for French, <laughs> not, not for Korean. Uh, and so those of us who said, well, we, we've done teacher training before. Let's to get, get together and say, OK, here's what we would like to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that. Uh, generally speaking, we didn't think the training program was all that yeah. good. Yeah. And because it was the first group to go to, to Korea, mm -hmm. although we had Koreans on the uh, staff, mm -hmm. the, training the training staff, staff. Yeah. sure. Yeah. But the people at the, the uh, site in Hilo, they had never trained uh, for Korea before. And so they were, you know, just mm -hmm. going to And this site that you described there, I mean, was it a site that Peace Corps used also for training others, groups that going to Asia, other countries? Yeah, that's right. There were actually mm -hmm. some Thai, Thai mm -hmm. uh, trainees on the campus at the same time. Yeah. This is the old um, uh, Hilo hospital. Mm. Um, if you think of where the new Hilo Hospital is, you go down the road a bit uh, towards the ocean and there is uh, Rainbow Falls. Mm -hmm. And just Mackay of Rainbow Falls was the hospital and a bunch of buildings that were places where we uh, stayed. Mm -hmm. I went back there a couple of years ago. Uh, where we stayed is no longer there. It's an empty space. The old hospital is there. It's looking pretty ragged. <laughs> <laughs> and we think today of Hilo, pretty quiet, small town. But I could imagine at that time even more remote and small, coming from you know the big megalopolis of Kansas City or, or Milwaukee, wherever you were. <laughs> None of us had cars. Yeah, there was yeah. no public transportation system. <laughs> we did a lot of hitchhiking. <laughs> Interesting. And so then you find yourself suddenly, boom, arriving in, 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 in Korea, South Korea, uh, the Republic of Korea. And, and here it was, I mean, you know, not too long, maybe 10, 12 years after the war ends. Uh, well, we shouldn't say ends. Technically, it never yeah. ended. But let's say the, the fighting would stop it. And the country is fighting itself, you know, trying to develop, trying to move ahead. Uh, and of course, Peace Corps in its role as a form of development assistance. This is part of our public uh, uh, diplomacy and, and, and support for development assistance. I mean, you arrive there. And what is the Korea of 1966? Uh, and having been able to see it over the years, and of course, today, 2013, is a different South Korea. But describe what you, uh, what you found when you arrived. Uh, Seoul was a big, busy, noisy, dirty city. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, kind of a shock because I had never been in a place where there were so many people at one time, mm -hmm. so many cars and buses at one time, more, more cars, more mm -hmm. buses than cars. The mm -hmm. cars were all taxis. There was almost no private ownership of cars mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, people themselves were very open, very accepting, very anxious to make us happy. Yeah. Probably much of it was fear that we were not going to succeed or <laughs> that we were going to die on the vine somehow. They there. wanted to do what they could to uh, help you out and survive. Yeah. There's a, mm. a K Korean phrase um, when you show appreciation or uh, something. Uh, you have so many troubles in, in our country. Uh, and you didn't want to say, yes, I have many troubles. We did, but you, you didn't mm -hmm. want to acknowledge that. Yeah. But that was a way of almost greeting us. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, the the, the team, the, or not the team, but this large cohort of, of the, the arriving Peace Corps volunteers arrive, and you're spread out. You're sent to different parts of the country. That's right. Uh, what was your assignment? Where did you end up? <laughs> Again, I, I, you know, I I thought, where would be a good place for me to go if I am asked the question? And they asked us the question. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, in those days. Um, Above the uh, age of seven, girls and boys were supposed to be in separate classes. Mm -hmm. So we were going to be sent to high schools. Therefore, mm -hmm. there were girls' high schools and boys' mm -hmm. high schools. There were no co-ed co schools at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I think I probably should be sent to a, a, a boys' school. I actually had come out of a boys' school as a high school student. And um, I'd like to go to a mountainous area because I was interested in hiking mm. and, and doing such things. And they sent me to a girls' school in a big <laughs> city that uh, was the um, bread box rice mm -hmm. bin of uh, <laughs> Korea was mostly flat. Yeah, oh gosh, so you had to find the mountain. Eventually you yeah, would, but of course. You don't have to go far <laughs> in Korea. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so you arrive and you end up in a girls' school, right? yeah. in, 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 in a high school. And uh, gosh, an experience that certainly must have been quite uh, well, a culture shock to arrive there and begin now this process of teaching English. And I wonder maybe if you could turn, because uh, you, you know, if you, as you reflect back on it now, and you've had several opportunities, we'll, we'll talk about these, but you know, as part of that first group, the K-1 group, as it was called, uh, you would also, I want to briefly fast forward, because you would have, have an opportunity to celebrate that experience with uh, a reunion, an alumni gathering of those first uh, Peace Corps volunteers. Not long ago, a couple of years ago, Peace Corps would celebrate its 50th anniversary right uh, just a couple of years ago that's right actually yeah. there, there's there's two celebrations uh -huh. let me mm -hmm. talk about the the first one first yeah, yeah. If that's okay the um, and and I suppose we'll go over some of the differences mm -hmm. we okay. would see in Korea in 66 versus the 21st century mm -hmm. but in in um, 2008 uh, Korea approached the Peace Corps, and by this time Peace Corps had been out of yeah. Korea for many years. Peace Corps only stayed there until 1981. Uh, they approached Korea and they said, we'd like to have a list of all the Peace Corps volunteers that had ever served in Korea. We'd like to bring them back. So this We'd was like the to, Korean government the initiative. Korean government, yeah, yeah. They, they reached out. This is uh, uh, Im Moon Bak yeah. uh, said, him himself had mm -hmm. gone to Washington and he, he brought this up. We'd, we'd like to bring them back and for a week we'd like to host them and have them return to their sites, mm -hmm. meet old friends, yeah, yeah. and uh, see the new Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was in, uh, it turned out that it didn't happen all at one time. Mm -hmm. They have every year either twice and twice or three times every year brought a cohort of mm -hmm. about 50 people back uh, and, and hosted them mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a week. Wow. Um, place, nice place to stay, mm -hmm. um, travel down country to wherever you were. Mm -hmm. They'd find the people that you had known. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it was really a, a marvelous Quite experience. amazing, because they're bringing full circle, because today, you know, you fast forward to this recent period, and, and Korea is a transformed country on so right. many levels. Well, we'll speak to that, but tell us a little bit more than about the anniversary this brought together, and you had a chance to revisit, and it just must have been amazing. So on that, and maybe we'll come later to the other anniversary, which is probably the Peace Corps itself, right? Well, it was um, the, the one for uh, Hilo. Yeah, the, oh, okay, for the training center. But back to maybe your first impressions, you arrived there, there and, and gosh, as you reflect back on that, I mean, any quick anecdotes or things that stand out? I mean, what were some of the, <laughs> I don't know, you know, again, you know, just little stories or anything you can share briefly? They uh, were determined not to put the Peace Corps volunteers in comfortable conditions that were <laughs> unrealistic when we first arrived, so they put us up in what are called yogon. Uh, these are uh, kind of inns. Inns, and so they put us in inns up in a certain portion of Seoul. Turned out later we found that out that that was the red light district of oh, Seoul. Gosh. I don't think Peace Corps knew that at the time. <laughs> but anyhow, we were in these uh, places. Um, the one I stayed in had one flush toilet, as I remember, uh, on the third floor. I 
got sick as a dog in that first week. Something I had eaten. Um, so for about two days, I was on my back. Um, but they, they really showed us uh, a nice time uh, yeah, as, yeah. as they could. They actually in, in, uh, invited us to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. We were addressed by the um, Minister of Education. Mm -hmm. uh, we visited several uh, universities. Mm -hmm. And uh, for about a week, we were seeing the sights of Seoul. Mm -hmm. And that was part of their welcome to kind of get you welcomed and then right. place you out in the areas. Well, we're going to come back to continue this amazing conversation. And of course, I look forward to your, your contrast of, gosh, that experience back in the early days. You would return later as a Peace Corps, I'm sorry, no, you, you returned to Hilo to be a Peace Corps trainer, but also later, as we'll see in a moment, uh, as a Fulbright Scholar, right. a very fascinating next step. So we're going to take a short break. I'm Carlos Juarez. This is Global Connections in the Think Tech radio series. We're talking with Ed Klein about Korea, and we'll be back in just a minute. So stay tuned for more of the story. Aloha, my name is Mike DeWert. I'm the Chief Scientist for ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm also on the board of the Hawaii Academy of Science and I'm the Energy Chair for the Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii, amongst other things. Next week, on the 19th of September, I'm gonna be doing a show with Jay. The topic will be how the 18th century had technology too. We'll talk about some of the technologies our ancestors had that we have forgotten and that we're gonna need if civilization ever collapses. So, hope to see you then and mahalo nui. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech series. And next week, my guest will be Tim Bostock of Bostock Productions and Kahilu Theater on the Big Island. Please join us Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We'll see you then. Aloha. Hi, I'm Attila Saras, and I'm the host of Think Tech Fridays. Be sure to tune in this Friday at 4 p.m. and every Friday, where we talk about the importance of technology in Hawaii. I'm Attila Sures, host for Think Tech Fridays. Mahalo. Aloha. I'm Hong Jiang at Think Tech. I'm a host for Asia in Review on Tuesday afternoon between 4 to 5 p.m. At our programs, we learn about what's happening in Asia and uh, why it is important for you to know about it. So I'm Hong Jiang, and I'll see you there. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. Yes, this is Think Tech broadcasting on Ustream and Spreaker both day and night, doing its thing on OC16 and Olelo, and uploading videos all over YouTube. Check us out and see the links on thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. And we're back, we're live, we're Think Tech, and it's Global Connections on the Think Tech radio series, talking about Korea, and we're joined by Ed Klein and you know, giving us a, you know, quick overview of his own experience there. You went as a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in the mid-60s by here in 66. Um, tell us a little bit more about, again, maybe that those first impressions and the kind of tasks that you had. You were in a high school for girls and, and began teaching English there. Um, and, you know, just maybe continue that story. And especially as we'll move ahead, you know, gosh, the contrast of, of the Korea that you know today, because you've seen this country evolve over, over that period. But back to your story. Right. Uh, in, in those days, uh, the big problem was where to put the P Peace Corps volunteers. Where would they live? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because uh, nowadays, uh, typically you go into Peace Corps and they uh, make sure that you have your own hut or you have your own apartment mm -hmm. or something of that nature. But there were no apartments in those mm -hmm. days and you couldn't afford to rent houses or something like that. So they asked that um, the school find a family that would put us up. Mm. And so I was put into a family of um, mother, father, older sister, middle brother, and younger brother. Uh, I learned a lot of Korean as a result of being mm -hmm. in that situation. Yeah. The father was a doctor, so they were not impoverished. They lived well comparatively, but we had no refrigerator, we had no television set, we had no bathroom, meaning a place where there is a bath. Uh, there was no flush toilet. It was an outhouse, but we were in the middle of the city, uh, even with an outhouse. Uh, and I slept on the floor uh, using the ondol system of heating the floor. Um, I was, I did have a room of my own, but I, I, I'm not a very tall person, and yet I didn't have much head space. <laughs> Sleeping the, the long yeah. way on the on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, I walked to school because the bus system that went there it was kind of odd how you'd have to go. Uh, so I walked to school. 
and I taught, um, you know, uh, in the first semester I taught uh, about a thousand different students. Oh my goodness. A thousand. Wow. Because every, every class had 60 to 63 students in it. And, and there were I many classes. <laughs> uh, eight uh, fresh, freshmen, well they were actually sophomores by our uh, count, and eight uh, classes of juniors. Wow. I begged in the second uh, semester if I could reduce that to just <laughs> one set of eight and uh, the principal agreed to that. Um, I continued to teach there for the one year and then Peace Corps said maybe we would do better to teach in the teacher training places mm -hmm. in these bigger cities. I, by the way, was in Kwangju, Chola Namdo Kwangju, and, um, and so I got one of the jobs at the National yes. University there. And that would be then helping to train the, the teachers themselves. Right. Uh, I was in yeah. the English yeah. department okay. and those people would go on to be mm -hmm. English teachers. Mm -hmm. um, that was a change, obviously, you then were moved to... But I stayed with the same family oh, and see. that was great. Oh, uh, good, good, good. So I'm still, yeah. you know, good friends, good you know, son yeah. of the family uh, with mm -hmm. that family. Yeah. My Korean mother is probably, uh, Korean father passed away some years ago. Korean mom is uh, probably 80, 85 or so. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Gosh. Well, bring us forward then. Uh, you know, you, you, you spent this time in, in, in Korea. You would find yourself coming back, but n still connected with the Peace Corps. In this case, you would go on to become one of the Peace Corps trainers back in the Hilo place, uh, the center that right. you had at begun. The, at the end of the my two-year commitment, mm -hmm. uh, I got a job to come back to Hilo to train new volunteers mm -hmm. going to Korea. That was about four months long, five months long, and then while I was there, I got a job to go back to Korea on the staff of the Korean staff mm -hmm. as what was called in those days a regional representative. So mm -hmm. I lived outside of Seoul in charge of X number of volunteers mm -hmm. in the provinces that I was... And so Peace Corps continued sending subsequent cohorts, quite a right, bit, a, a right. large program that would continue for about 15 years, roughly? Exactly yeah. 15 okay. years, yeah. yeah 66 yeah. to 81. 81. And so, you know, here you would then return eventually after your experience there, find yourself embarking on an academic career, finishing your, your doctoral studies at the University of Hawaii. Right. Uh, and then, uh, early 80s, suddenly you're back in Korea in a different capacity. Tell us about what brings you back there. Uh, I applied for a Fulbright and mm -hmm. got a Fulbright for a university, Sogang uh, University in Seoul. Mm -hmm. And I spent a year and a half there. Mm -hmm. uh, this time it was quite different. I was with my family, my yeah, own family. Yeah. Uh, by that time we had three kids mm -hmm. in a, a cute little house uh, in one of the uh, neighborhoods of Seoul. Mm -hmm. uh, it had some interesting stories too, but we certainly don't have time for all yeah. those stories. Uh, <laughs> And um, that was very productive. I, I wrote a lot. I learned a lot mm -hmm. during that. And you were time. essentially as a visiting scholar at that point. Yes. You're, you're connected to the university. You do some lecturing and you know right. research activity and the like. It, were there noticeable differences? You know, even that in that you know period. I mean, you return essentially 15 years later. The Korea is suddenly now becoming more developed. They were putting in the subway. Uh, the buses were a little bit faster and cleaner. <laughs> uh, they were still noisy, uh, lots of honking of horns and yeah, such. Yeah. Uh, but we still had problems like the water might go mm -hmm. off, the uh, electricity might go off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, fascinating. Well, uh, you know, again, just as we have a lot to cover and, and, and continue this dialogue, as you move forward, you then embark on what is, you know, been a long time career in, in the academic area, but you have continued your connections to Korea, you know, both, uh, you know, returning for research interests uh, and, and increasingly here, certainly Hawaii, like many parts of the U.S. mainland now, a lot of Korean students coming and teachers. Uh, and I wonder if you might just maybe give us a quick snapshot. I mean, you're continued relationship with Korea. You fast forward to where you are now, you've you've continued to see this country and, and one can only imagine, you know, from that period in your first exposure in 1966, you fast forward to 2013, it's a very, you know, rapidly industrialized country, very modern, very, you know, and, and but the challenges that that might bring, right? The, tell us a little bit about your, your impressions these days as you go <laughs> back. I mean, this is not the quite the same place. Of, not, not at all the same you know. place. The uh, Creature comforts, we used to use that term a lot, the creature comforts of Korea, you know, uh, in, in some ways uh, they're more wired than us, uh, there's uh, a lot more 
uh, going on in, in certain aspects of the uh, society than what we have going on here in terms of uh, um, uh, the computerized uh, yeah. things. Or even building rail systems. We could probably learn oh. quite a bit from Korea about uh, the, uh, how to uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, develop. Uh, subway is very, very uh, comprehensive in mm -hmm. Seoul now. Yeah. And uh, very easy to use, uh, not expensive, goes lots of places, and uh, the buses are very civilized now. <laughs> uh, the Everybody has a car. Uh, it's uh, a case where the uh, the economics has really taken off, and um, you know the people. Uh, I had a, a a good friend who was from a quite you know hard pressed family back in Cholanamdo in the days. Now they've all lit, moved to Seoul. Um, everybody's driving. Yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody's so there's been considerable well. social mobility and, and, yes, and economic yes. uh, well-being. And and again, maybe just because you've had this opportunity to really have a family that, that invited you in and, and helped you uh, really become a, uh, embedded there in the culture, and you've seen that family, you stay still in touch with them. Their own situation. I mean, they, they've gone from being well, even though the the father was a doctor, but he said they probably were more modest in, in their, you know. Yeah, but they they live in a. a expensive part of town now <laughs> and uh, they have a big apartment mm -hmm. that's a, the interesting thing lots of people live in apartments yeah, yeah. Well, no matter the, how much money you've yeah got. the nature of the the rather dense population, dense population of course yes, yes. Yeah. oh quite amazing uh, well I wonder I mean as, as you think back now I mean uh, one of the interesting puzzles is you know what is the legacy of that experience I mean the United States of course has been a long time uh, you know, ally with South Korea and that alliance you know has meant many things among them you know we have continued to provide a security yeah. you know defensive yeah. if you will but but this uh, Peace Corps role was really a very important development uh, assistance of sorts and you know when you think back I mean clearly uh, it had an impact on them in different ways I mean even today I mean Korea continues to be you know carrying out in some ways, well, we'll talk about this in a moment, but their own role, what was that impact? Um, but I, I gather from what you described earlier, the appreciation they have, I mean, we, we understand, you know, Korea yeah. to be a very, you know, sort of pro-U.S. culture and society. Uh, the Peace Corps certainly probably helped foster some of that on a, even a micro level. Well, we, we find out that uh, when we first went into Korea, the idea of voluntarism was kind of foreign. Yeah. You know, what yeah, does yeah. it mean to be a volunteer? Why would these young Americans spend two years sleeping on the floor and going to the outhouse. Why are yeah, why they are you coming? Are they all spies? <laughs> and we had to convince them that we're not spies. Uh, but that was not a yeah, familiar yeah. concept. Today, there's actually a program in Korea that does the same thing yeah. to other nations that are in the developmental yeah. stage. Yeah. It's called Koika, Korean uh, Koika, Inter national uh, cooperation association mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah. and they uh, send people out to uh, work in health uh, health uh, clinics uh, to teach people how to use computers uh, and so on and so forth mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, that's part of the legacy. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah and, and you spoke about this idea, about, the yeah, concept yeah. of volunteerism, which the Peace Corps essentially is. I mean, you don't go in it for the money, so to speak. You've got a service, <laughs> uh, you know, commitment. You've got uh, obviously a desire to help people and in, 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 in the issues of development. Uh, and and interesting to see, you know, and, and make that case that gosh, after seeing this experience, the Koreans seem to have. And now embrace that. Uh, some could even say that about some other uh, place like Taiwan too. It was a recipient for many years of our aid, and today, like Korea, it also has a development right, right. role. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we come back. Uh, but uh, fascinating to think of, you know, that the Peace Corps, its 15 years there, probably helped plant the seed and, and you know, essentially uh, develop this new understanding of what it means to both provide assistance and be, you know, supportive of development needs. Uh, and you know, look forward to that. Uh, let me propose that we take a short break here, uh, and and we'll be back in a moment. Um, uh, I'd like to continue this conversation. This is Global Connections uh, in the Think Tech Radio series. We've been talking with Ed Klein here about Korea and his long uh, involvement there, initially as a Peace Corps volunteer, as a Peace Corps trainer to help future Peace Corps 
volunteers go, returning as an academic scholar, and really over these past years continuing a relationship that now involves both more Koreans that are coming here to Hawaii for you know different educational needs and, and teacher training themselves. Uh, we'll be back in just a short minute, so please stay tuned for more of the story. We're back, we're live, and we're Think Tech. And this is Global Connections in the Think Tech radio series. I'm Carlos Juarez. We're joined by Ed Klein and want to continue our conversation about Korea. And basically, as you were just telling us, I mean, here's a country that had been a recipient of, of U.S. assistance uh, in the form of the Peace Corps and, and, and really uh, this development at the very grassroots level, you know, affecting individuals and communities. And uh, that program would eventually come to an end by 1981. Uh, you fast forward another decade or two, and, and here's Korea, a pretty you know well-developed country, now part of the you know, sort of the G20 kind of a dynamic and robust economy, uh, and it today is a essentially a country that carries out a simpler kind of role. Uh, this notion of volunteerism that may not have been there in the early days, but now you've got Korean young Koreans that are uh, in places like Africa, other Asian countries. Right. Tell you know, give us a quick snapshot and, and maybe what you've come to learn about what they're doing in, in different parts of the world. What what kind of assistance do they provide? Um, most of the time, you see them working in health. You mm -hmm. see them working in um, uh, technical areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, because that's what Korea is very good at now. Uh, I don't think they're out there teaching English, but <laughs> one, uh, one interesting thing I read was uh, that in some nation, the people there did not have a written language, and they actually suggested that they take Hangul, the Korean alphabet, and try to write their language in <laughs> that alphabet. I don't know if that's <laughs> continued or not, but they, mm -hmm. you know, there was an attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of gratifying to think that um, after all these years, uh, this what seemed to be me to be a very poor country uh, in 1966 is. Uh, striking out on their own and doing a similar yeah, thing. Yeah. And you know, and again maybe just thinking of that contrast, nineteen sixty six Korea, other than the you know the you know, the elites at the top who are sort of maybe connected more to outside people, uh, English is not widely spoken, I would imagine. And so you're you're coming there to help some of that. Yeah, I mean English still is a is is a, is a problem in that it's not taught uh, terribly well. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly improving, and we have many more people who speak English acceptably, you know, uh, that we come in contact with from Korea. Um, the government has decided to send a number of people outside of Korea to mm -hmm. try to learn English better, and we at HPU are uh, a part of that. Mm -hmm. We uh, have groups that come, and we work with them. Uh, usually they're uh, English teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. Korea has decided that it's not just going to teach English on the from the middle school level up. That would be seventh grade up, mm -hmm. but uh, down to uh, third grade and mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. and um, and in the private schools even lower than that they may be teaching English. Yeah. So the people who are <coughs> the the stu the teachers uh, are coming outside uh, Korea to get better at English yeah, and we're yeah. doing some of that. Basically. And, and uh, you know, again, my, 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 you know, I'm not as familiar with, the, with, let's say, the world of language learning and teaching, uh, but it is obviously must be different to teach a third grader or, a, you know, a kindergartner. Oh, absolutely, uh, yes. In, in terms of, yeah. you know, the strategies and, and, and so on. No doubt we would all know that as you start earlier, you're likely to you know, learn it uh, more and, and, and absorb things more. That's just if, if you keep at it. Uh, yes. But basically, up until let's say the seventh grade or the the time when uh, uh, puberty actually uh, comes out, you begin to 
you uh, need to have more explanation and you're more analytic but before then it's much more a natural process yeah. of learning mm -hmm. and those two approaches have to be different yeah well and so as you describe I mean today the teacher training that we do here in the US and, and elsewhere I mean it is broader than just the very basics for adults it's it's reaching into teaching English for children right. and, and and the like um, and I guess uh, you know. I guess when I envision you know Korea and and it's a country that I, I mean I haven't been able to travel there as much. I've had one short visit, uh, but you know given its connection to the global economy, a very you know powerful trading country. Uh, certainly, those who are doing business have to have a working knowledge of English. But I mean, you, you described just a moment ago how maybe they still have challenges or issues. Uh, and, and yet, is that different for maybe the younger populations, or is it still a very real? I, I think the younger. Uh a good number of younger people have better English, mm. and uh, and people are hired for their English. Yeah. Uh, so having the skills is, is fact, valuable for your. One of the problems career. is if if you go into the English department to learn English, it's not always the case that you end up being a teacher of English. Yeah. If your English you is good, <laughs> business snaps you of up. Of course. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, and that makes sense because again, as as a country that's you know deeply engaged in a lot of global uh, economic activity, they need a, you know, a, a working population that can do that. Um, and I wonder maybe if you could, uh, maybe just continuing from your reflections as, as someone who's had you know, just a long career working with this uh, country and, and, and you know, being connected to it, I mean, uh, tell me a little bit more about your impressions. I mean, uh, what, what are some of the challenges they continue to face? Uh, what are ways in which, and you know, we've described already maybe one legacy is uh, ha having an impact on their notion of volunteerism. Are there other things that you've seen change in Korean society, Korean culture? Um, yeah, very much so. Uh, it wasn't long after I left as a Peace Corps volunteer that there was a big push. Uh, the new village movement, Seimaul Undong it was called, uh, to modernize the countryside. Mm. And so all the thatch roofs disappeared. Mm. Everybody has a tile roof or yeah. a tin roof now. Uh, electricity was put through. Every village had a mm -hmm. paved road uh, to it. And all that was uh, wonderful. Even the, the um, uh, rice paddies were straightened out so you could get more rice <laughs> yeah. per yeah. square foot than like a very, the other know, way. Strategic planning process very, very and so. you know, careful so. uh, you know, uh, direction that came to try to coordinate all that. Now, the problem, or one problem, was that a lot of the people who had been farmers didn't want to be farmers anymore. Mm. Number one, because they didn't need so many hands, yeah. things were mechanized. But the second thing is, I can make more money in the city, so I'm going to go to the city. And Papa and Mama are left out there, uh, you know, to do the farm. Um, the young men who, for example, stayed, uh, the women didn't want to marry the farmers. Yeah. And so they went into the cities and we actually can see now a number of immigrants from countries in Southeast Asia into Korea mm. to get married to the farmers. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. To, yeah okay. So there's been sort of a, an urbanization that's drawn a lot of the working force of yeah. people. Suddenly those rural areas, the farms, are you know just no. older people? They need a, a you know fresh uh, people, and so migration has come in. And again, I envision you know Korea is a relatively homogeneous society. But what you're describing here is you've had an influx of a lot of new exactly different and that, people that, coming uh, in. Yeah. You know the the folks from Southeast Asia. Uh, it's kind of a difficult problem mm -hmm. because they're not Koreans, and yes, uh, yes. you get lots of newspaper articles about you know, the difficulties or the successes of somebody acculturating to uh, mm -hmm. Korean rural society. Yes. That is um, a, a topic that... Yeah. Uh, and of course, another aspect, while we were describing Korea and, and the country itself, I mean, it is a country with a very, very large diaspora, communities that reside yes. outside, uh, particularly in the U.S. and elsewhere, but, you know, those even in a state like Hawaii, we've had different waves, some who came much earlier and, and part of our, you know, economy, and more recent arrivals, perhaps the more business right. class and, and people who are coming, and even, uh, as I recall, I mean, there's sort of this uh, notion that many of them often will send their children to go study <laughs> abroad and live with the yeah. auntie or, yeah. or the friend. Uh, is this something that you're familiar with yourself, or is it part of the culture that you've uh, yes, because the uh, it's still a problem in, in Korea to uh, 
get into the right schools and yeah. end up with a, a good job as a result of coming out of uh, if you get into the right school, fine, but if you haven't gotten into the right school, well, it's more difficult. No. However, if you go outside the country and can get a, uh, we don't care too much what school, but uh, you speak English, yeah. you can come back and uh, have an find a place and, 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 yeah. in the society. No, well, this has been a great story, and I want to thank you so much. I mean, as someone who's been able to see the country evolve, and you've been just a major contributing factor to that, and, and Korea, of course, has been a integral part of your life so long. Uh, I'm just fascinated by, by, by how the impact of something like a Peace Corps program has had on their mm -hmm. culture. Now they are the ones out there, you know, helping other developing countries uh, with similar issues. Uh, this has been a great opportunity to learn about this, and I thank you so much, Ed. Uh, uh, we're going to be out of time here, and I just want to, you know, wrap it up here. Uh, my name is Carlos Juarez, and this is the Global Connection Show, part of the Think Tech Radio series. We've been talking with Ed Klein and, and a great uh, story about his experience in Korea where he first went as a Peace Corps volunteer, returned as a Fulbright Scholar, and has maintained uh, a long-standing relationship and continues working with Koreans here in Hawaii. Uh, thank you all for being here. I want to thank all those involved that helped us put this show together, uh, in particular Jay Fidel who makes it all happen somehow. I want to thank you, our listeners, for listening. Uh, and Think Tech will be back very soon uh, with our next show in the Think Tech series, so stay tuned. Uh, if you want to get our daily email or social media advisories, click the link on thinktechhawaii.com. If you'd like to be a guest, a sponsor, or a Think Tech underwriter, contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. Thank you so much. Remember, we broadcast this live on the Internet at 2 and at 4 every weekday. All the shows are streamed on Ustream and on Spreaker. If you want to links to those, you can go, uh, or other broadcasts we put on YouTube, go to thinktechhawaii.com, and you can go to our Facebook page and tell them you like us. And, of course, we'll see you here next uh, at the Global Connection Show. Aloha.